from Kemol Prescott Road. We welcome you all this evening, this morning, tonight, wherever in the world you are. I want to give a very, very special thanks to Chaitanya Sambrani, who is chairing this evening, who it, for whom it's very late at night in Australia, and a very special thanks to Akhil Bilbrami, to whom it's very, very early in the morning. Um, we especially welcome all our guests, Shruta, uh, Shruta Prada, uh, uh, Sen Gupta, Shali, Anish Dawande, and Pushpamala uh, M. Uh, I, I think if we tried in a room to get all these people together at any point, it would be so difficult. So it's an honor to have this stellar, stellar panel with us this evening. Thank you as we begin. And, um, the, chair, the evening will be chaired by uh, Chaitanya Sambrani, um, and he will continue the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shireen, and um, greetings, everyone, um, whatever time of day it is that you find us together here. It is indeed a great pleasure and an honor to uh, be in such excellent company, old friends and new friends, uh, meeting together in this um, time of um, great crisis. Um, my thanks absolutely to uh, Shireen and Behroz uh, for initiating this webinar and uh, to Behroz and her collaborator Dilesh to, uh, for having made the uh, moving uh, documentary, Keki Manzil, House of Art, um, which um, is part of the reason that um, we are gathered together here. Um, it is because of um, the relationship between modernism, art, nation building, and the remarkable lives and careers of Keku and Korshad Gandhi uh, and the gallery that they started. Uh, that many of the conversations that so many of us have been part of uh, have taken off. Uh, accompanying me today um, are uh, Akhil Bilgrami. Uh, he is the Sydney Morgan Besser Professor of Philosophy at uh, Columbia University in New York. We also have uh, Shalene Vathwana from New Delhi, uh, a freelance curator, arts and heritage professional and art educator. Um, we have Anish Gawande with us from Bombay. Uh, he's a writer and translator and director of the Dara Shikom Fellowship um, that run a very interesting program in Kashmir. Shuddha Brata Sengupta from New Delhi, uh, an artist, writer, a curator, and one third of the Rux Media Collective. Uh, we also have with us Pushpamala N from Bangalore, a photo and video performance artist. The purpose of this panel is to reflect on several of the issues that are highlighted by the film Keki Manzil, House of Art. You could also think about Keki Manzil, House of Love in a strange and very interesting manner in which the lives of the Gandhis intersected with the lives of so many other people. But it is also a discussion around questions of particular import to the historical juncture within which we find ourselves. Um, the film is about art, it is about history. It is a tribute from a child to her parents. It is a letter to her hometown from an expatriate. It is a gesture of fondness from one sibling to others. Above all, it is about the courage with which Keku and Khorshed Gandhi approached various tasks in their personal and professional lives. And it is about the uh, art that uh, they fostered um, and the task of nation building that this art took on quite seriously. The idea of a secular egalitarian nationhood that was implicit in the birth of Indian modernism and central to 
the contemporary art scene in India. The film asks us to think and reflect about a time that sometimes seems bygone, to reflect upon the, an idea of India that is under deep existential threat. The outpouring of emotion that has accompanied the release of the film is testament to the tremendous influence that um, Keku and Khorshed had over various people whose lives they touched. But it is also very important to remember that the exceptional circumstances within which this film has seen um, met its publics and the extra extraordinary circumstances that have um, overtaken the idea of India in the years 19, uh, 2019, 2020, uh, make it absolutely incumbent upon us as art workers, as curators, as artists, as thinkers, um, to consider our positions and to um, stake our claim to the idea of India that we seek to foster and to defend. The way in which this panel uh, will be run is that um, um, a minute long clip from different parts of the film, Keki Manzil House of Art, will be screened. Um, I've chosen these clips as containing the germs, containing the seeds of um, uh, discussion uh, points that we will then undertake to address. Um, at the end of each of these one minute long clips, I will um, invite one of our um, panelists to present um, reflections on issues that uh, arise out of that clip. And uh, we also have the possibility of taking questions from the audience. Um, and those are to be uh, delivered via the chat function of Zoom. So we are not going to take uh, questions via a microphone from the audience. Uh, they will be typed up text questions that I will then um, ask the panelists to respond to. Um, we are here together for roughly an hour, and um, um, please um, enjoy um, the experience. And um, it is once again really wonderful to be together in such wonderful company. If I may ask um, Nidhi, uh, our uh, Tech administrator to please screen the first of the. The war torn Bombay Papa returned to was an open city, a haven for the rural poor, but also Allied soldiers and sailors and those escaping persecution in Nazi Germany. As always, Bombay was a city busy remaking itself. Bombay was central, had been so from the moment of its creation. The bastard child of a Portuguese-English wedding, and yet the most Indian of Indian cities. In Bombay, all Indias met and merged. In Bombay too, all India met what was not India, what came across the black water to flow into our veins. It was an ocean of stories. We were all its narrators and everybody talked at once. There's an abiding sense uh, listening to Rashdi reading from the Moor's Last Sigh of um, a, an enduring cosmopolitanism in late colonial Bombay. And um, the, the, the first prompt that comes, uh, I'd like to uh, ask Shudha to um, please respond to the, to the notion of cosmopolitanism uh, in terms of both late colonial but also post-colonial India. And what might the fate of such cosmopolitanism be in the 21st century um, when that sea of stories that Rashdi speaks about is um, 
addled with reefs. Um, thank you, Chaitanya, and thank you, uh, Behroz and Shireen, for this invitation to think with and for and to this uh, lovely film, uh, which I really enjoyed as an experience uh, looking back at time, uh, thinking of a different place. Bombay is not my city, but I've always loved it. And uh, thank you, Chaitanya, for that prompt. Um, I mean, I take this question of a city being a world um, as one of my points of departure. And I think Rushdie is right when he says that Bombay is where, um, the, where all Indias met to create a world and where India met the world to create another world. And um, this idea of Bombay being like Calcutta, like um, perhaps Delhi in the 18th century and the 19th century, uh, and once again, um, were these great cosmopolitan cities. Uh, so much so that um, when the Samyukta Maharashtra Samiti, um, Sanghar Samiti agitation to carve out a Maharashtra state for Marathi speakers happened. And this was in some tension to the idea of the undivided Bombay presidency, the Bombay state that existed. There was a moment where Bombay also considered, or many people in Bombay considered the possibility of the city being a free state, um, sort of halfway between Singapore and something else where because of its port, because, because it was looking out at the world, that it didn't need the bulwark of, um, of a hinterland, that its hinterland, in a sense, was the sea, uh, which I think is a very interesting idea, that Bombay's, um, Bombay's context is as much the sea as it is the land. At that time, the Sangyukta Maharashtra Samiti, which was this motley combination of left and right, but Marathi chauvinists, uh, would often paint a slogan on the walls of Bombay, pejoratively, uh, which was cosmopolitan vareva. Um, and it's, it was written in Marathi, the word cosmopolitan. So cosmopolitan was in a sense a kind of jibe that here are these deracinated people, they have no links to anything, we are the ones with the sons of the soil. But I think they missed uh, something. They missed the fact that Bombay and the western coast of India was actually embedded in a network sense of the world. And this was not a new thing. It went back several centuries. I mean, if you look at even the Kaneri caves or the Buddhist caves uh, on the West Coast, there's, there's obviously traces of travelers coming that are Arab settlers, the Jewish settlements, the Portuguese and Chinese, all these kinds of people. And the Zoroastrians, of course, who make Bombay the city it is. So um, in that sense, Bombay is really that bridge between the world and what was happening here. And I think it, you can sense that in this film where what this great city provides is a set of accidents or chance encounters which are absolutely transformative in a beautiful way. So whether it's um, Keku Gandhi and his brother strolling on the beach, meeting a Belgian with his motor car stuck in the sand, which they help lift, and he's Roger Van Dam, and that's how the Kimol business starts, right? That's a completely chance encounter. Now, it's a city like Bombay that allows that to happen. Or the Italian prisoners of war who come to their home and you know cook pasta and talk about art. Or people like Charles Fabri or Walter Langhammer who play a key critical role, uh, both refugees, Langhammer actually is a refugee who was also made into a prisoner of war because he's an Austrian citizen and no one really cares that he's Jewish or has a Jewish wife, is fleeing Nazism. As far as the British is concerned, they're Austrian citizens, they belong in a prisoner of war camp. And he walks, he talks his way out of the prisoner of war camp by talking about art and in a sense walks into the life of the circle around Keku Gandhi and what becomes Kimold. All these encounters where these and for me, whether it's Hussein coming from the hinterland or Souza coming up from Goa or meeting each other accidentally, Krishan Khanna being a partition refugee in Bombay, all these strange encounters between people who come from scattered from different parts of the world make up that art scene. And I think that's very vital that what becomes Kemold, what becomes the enterprise that Keku and Khorshad Gandhi 
uh, are at the fulcrum of is that world embracing home for people from everywhere, the, you know, who float in from everywhere, tossed by the storm, essentially, of the 20th century. Um, it's funny to hear Rushdie speak because, you know, we don't get it in the film, but anyone who's read Moore's Last Sigh knows that Keku Gandhi is in the book. He is a character called Keku Modi, who runs an art gallery, which is attacked by right-wing fanatics. And he has, and the artist, Aurora Zoigoibi, has to cut a deal name. And she calls up this man called Raman Fielding, the be, one of the best characterizations of the, of the late Bal Thakare, and says, name a price. And I'm sure that someone like Keku Gandhi would have been witness to many situations like this, where the city and the world and the street met each other sometimes at their rough edges. And that sense of those kind of, how does one put it, that, that, that um, sort of tectonic movements of politics, culture, ways of being, coursing through this small art gallery, shaping it, reshaping it, is, is really critical. I want to make one point quickly before I end, and then I'll come back to some things. It's incorrect to assume that this, what we call cosmopolitanism was merely a transaction between South Asia and some notion of the West or Europe. It was as much a transaction with East Africa, with Southern Africa, with, with China, with the Dutch East Indies, with, especially with Iran. So if you look at the 30s and 40s, the first Iranian talking film gets made in Bombay by Ardeshir Irani, whom I'm sure Keku Gandhi would have known, who is also the person who makes the first Indian talking film, Alamara. So Dokhtar Elor, which is the first Iranian film, gets made within the same industrial setup which produces Indian cinema. Um, you also have the first Iranian modern novel, The Blind Owl by Sada Khadayat, who is living as a kind of half exile in Bombay, as there were many Iranians in Bombay, which is kind of an avant-garde model, and it's set in Bombay. Even the film, Dr. Elor, features a couple who run away from Iran, come to Bombay. So there is a way in which in this Iran connection will surface later, and I'll have reason to talk about it, that this openness to the world was not what we tend to think it's, it's a, that it was a bridge only between some kind of unreflected upon East and an unreflected upon West. It was really a dense meshwork of many connections. I'll stop there for now. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, thinking about cosmopolitanism as being much more than the uninflected East versus West binary. Um, especially in terms of the network um, that, that you invoke, the mesh work that you invoke. Um, I'd like to ask you to speak a bit further about the way in which Bombay, the city in which um, Keku and Khorshed embark upon this adventure looks both eastwards and westwards from its pendulum position on the west coast of the subcontinent. And it's looking inward into the Deccan and outward across the Arabian Sea. Um, and those migrants that arrive in Bombay from various quarters of the subcontinent, where they meet migrants that arrive from various quarters of the world. Um, so I'd like to, like to hear you speak a bit more about um, the, the, the heady mix and not always an easy mix yeah. that um, pertains to these collisions. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me say that, you know, I mean, this business of cosmopolitanism is something that sometimes we don't even know what, that it's there. I mean, you take the clip that we saw. It's from a 1950 film that I like very much called Samadhi with Ashok Kumar. And it's a spy thriller. It's, it's an international spy thriller. Uh, and the song that we were hearing, Gore Gore Mate Chori, is actually taken as a riff of a song called Chico Chico from Puerto Rico. Nobody cares. I mean, as far as you're concerned, when that song is being sung, and we've all heard it being sung many times, 
it's as you know as indian as chinna badam which is chinese peanuts um and i think that's the crucial thing is that cities like bombay produce these conditions where the world becomes a natural part of our everyday patwa so that when you look at what's special about let's say the division of time in bombay uh, one of the clearest things that i miss in a city like delhi is the fact that you can't really have a life of the very, of the transition between night and very early morning right and in bombay you can because of the docks and because of the loading and unloading that goes on all the time and that's a time signature that let's say the irani cafes used to cater to they would have a shift in time where the sh- the people going home from the last shift in the docks and people coming in for the first shift of the docks could meet at the same place and have tea and this was produced by these people who were 19th century immigrants from iran and they occupy those corner houses which are sort of a triangular because the vastu is wrong and nobody else takes them so they make these choices to produce spaces in the city which then become homes for all kinds of people at different points of day and night if you look at the films of the 50s they revel in this nature of the city as a time of unpredictable things happening at night whether it's you know shri 420 or jag tera ho or avara shehar aur sapna bombay raat ki baahon mein they all about what can happen at night and worlds meet at night and i think that's you know you get a sense of that of these parties and conversations and what happens after an exhibition in the film there's a very lively life of human beings deciding to do things that they don't have to do and that for me that's crucial that keku gandhi and uh, and korshad gandhi create a context where people can unwind and it's a very essential thing for an art scene i think right now in contemporary indian art there's very few places where people can just stop being this you know the the, the people who show up at the openings you don't get to be a human being afterwards right and it's absolutely vital and essential that that can happen and i think that that's a context that they create so it's also a, the film is about these friendships right they these relationships that keku and korshad have with these artists are intimate and animated by friendship they're not just the dealer artist relationship they're much more than that and that can happen because of the way in which the world enters this space thank you shuddha um as as a result of these these um intimacies these friendships of the heart these friendships of the mind um that enrich the world of keku and korshed um there is a sense of a construction of a community um a very important construction of community that um extends um because it speaks a particular intellectual language or a particular hybrid language um that is made up of um elements of different kinds um that have come together to form what we call modernism in india um i'd like to ask shalin to um join the conversation at this point and and think from her vantage point and from her generational perspective as well um about the idea of insiders and outsiders and what what in the uh, history of india uh in the modern history of india um has become a really crucial um uh, um and extremely troublesome um set of ideas that that are uh, about questioning the plural inheritance that we have hitherto uh, been proud of uh, of uh, producing sectarian histories of belonging um and i'd like uh, shalin if you would uh, like to 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 think about this through your own experience um, of the last uh, few years he 
have the only picture framing company in Asia. A passion for art fired up by the Italians. And he lived in a city on the lookout for something new. Then the final piece. One afternoon, 1944, an Austrian artist walked into the framing shop. Professor Langhammer, he, he was an Austrian painter who was also a refugee from Austria. A thing that really got me more and more charged was that Langhammer taught me some of the principles of how to choose a frame to make the picture complete. Yeah, so uh, as, as I was saying earlier, the, the question of insiders and outsiders in India and the, the, the notion of an accretion of layers upon layers um, that, that produces the plural inheritance that uh, we are so proud of. Um, and I'd love, love, to, love to hear your reflections um, on this notion of a plural inheritance and histories of belonging. Thank you. In fact, uh, I think you uh, started me off with a fantastic phrase, the histories of belonging, because um, that is something that is under such uh, contestation right now. Um, and uh, this film gives us uh, an insight into how there is so much that we would not have were we to remove all of the outsider, the other, or the foreign from us as how we're defining this very tenuous relationship between what's an insider and what's an outsider today. So carrying forward from Shuddha, like if I were to look at it, um, there was a Belgian manufacturer, Rotterdam. There was um, Italian prisoners of wars that taught uh, Keku Gandhi, Khoshik Gandhi uh, through their salon-like um, inclusions into how to look at art. We're looking at Langhammer, who is finally um, an Australian, uh, Austrian painter coming in and uh, there are these different bits of foreigners uh, to whom we have so much to credit to an extent. Um, we have Raza talking about how uh, there was so much that he learned about certain techniques of painting from Langhammer or the Dean of the GJ School of Art um, in many parts in the film uh, talking about how Langhammer's method of instruction was something that the progressives looked at and it informed so much of how they made art. Um, I think that if we're looking at that, there's a certain self-reflection we all need to have about where do we come from and what is home for us. Um, the film beautifully starts with uh, the fact that the Gandhi family traces, it roots, uh, traces its roots to uh, Persian ancestry. Um, my grandfather was born in Burma. Um, so I think if we start looking inwards, we would all find that where is it that we truly belong? Where do we want to create a territory? And where do we want to stop in a time and space continuum and say that, okay, this is exactly where we define the territory of India. And anything before this is outside, it's foreign. And anything after this is welcome and it's included and can have this great citizenship. And that's about it. So history is never that static. And history is never linear. So when it comes to history making, history writing, who's writing it and to whom it serves is, is one of the biggest things we need to question right now because the, the India, the pluralistic India that we're inheriting, uh, especially the ones that Anish and I are a part of and that, that we're trying to understand, we're trying to make part of, um, has this shifting boundary of of home basis a certain convenience depending on who is the power stakeholder but that's not how convenient you can be with the definition of home because that clearly has landed us at a moment in time where we have um, agitations across all definitive territories of the republic of india trying to understand who is an insider and who is not and who is an outsider and who's foreigner uh, when we start looking at pre-independent India, which is kind of where the clip is from, because then it's moving towards 47. There are these, these um, infusions of so many different uh, sources, the mishmash that Shudha spoke about. Um, in that, there is a certain degree of, of course, 
a certain kind of convenient foreignness. But now when we study history and we start looking at this long big canon behind us, uh, the canonical history, we're now trying to look at invaders. We're trying to look at, oh, these came from the outside. So if we, if we were to actually just remove all of these outside foreign elements, what would we be left with? Is there a certain point of indigenousness that um, we need to kind of redefine just so certain things are a bit more peaceful? That's kind of problematic right now. In addition to that, I'm not definitely confusing this with the decolonization, which is important world over. That is a fantastic movement taking place through museum collections, through cultural institutions, where there is definitely a need for decolonization. But to confuse that with where we are right now, where we need to so question so much about um, what is the role of secularism, because there is always so much of a debate right now about whether it was part of the constitution or not, which is laughable. Or when we're talking about um, a pluralistic inheritance, uh, there is simply such a big, big movement uh, defining that, no, this is this one singular inheritance and we don't want anything outside of it or other than it. That would be a very narrow definition of how to understand India. That would be a, a disservice to so many inflection points that this film talks about, which has such fantastic contributions from those that are probably not even part of the Indian identity as we're so trying to cloister it in this small little two line definition and not allowing any other interpretation of it. So I think there, there we have so much to question right now. And in the last couple of years, um, we have had so many different movements coming forth um, with regards to changes in the constitution, with regards to changes in trying to understand who gets to be a citizen um, and what does that mean? Uh, which part of uh, India should that belong to and hence that origin kind of makes it okay. And this is a film to kind of start and stop at to try and understand, you know, maybe we're going about it so, so wrong and we need to really revise what we write in our history books, what our history teachers are teaching us, and who is it that we're negotiating these boundaries with, and who do we want to continually fight to include? And those have been precisely the role of the last two years. And, and I think that within this panel, there's so many people that have done such, such stellar work, whether it is when it comes to student politics, whether it is when it comes to Kashmir, whether it is when it comes to any kind of um, agitation and, and uh, raising uh, a voice that's very, very important. I would like to leave us all with a um, last thought on um, the fact that art provides a certain kind of window, which probably nothing else does. So when we look at movements which have barely made their way to our history books, like the India and Bangladesh relationship, we have so much of KK Heber to look at to try and understand what actually happened there. That's very important or uh, tie up for, for uh, all of the uh, imageries of partition and how they made their way through. Uh, or Bupin for a ph phenomenally different way of understanding uh, sexuality and human relationships. So art is like so important and right now that itself comes under a certain banner of tolerance. And when it doesn't fall into it, it itself provides uh, so much um, uh, it provides so many problems when artists can't express, when we have so many um, problems in terms of freedoms of expression right now. And art is one of the most natural ways and forms of human expression, archaeologically proven. So, so that's kind of where I'm leaving us at for more, more conversation. Thank you very much, Shaleen. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly grateful uh, that you steered the conversation towards the role of artists, because that is precisely uh, where I'd like to bring the conversation to Pushpa Mala. Um, as a photo and video performance artist, Pushpa, you are somebody who actually puts your physical self out there into the work uh, and, and, and um, confronts the uh, questions that um, matter to you through a physical manifestation through photo, for photography and performance work. Um, if we could try to have the um, uh, next clip, uh, clip number three. Can you do 
um, which will uh, provide a really uh, lovely entry point for the question that I have for Pushpa Mahala to address. You think Shalini can put it on? Because she, she could, uh, yeah? First of all, these were, if you like, the first generation of so-called professional artists. It's as if it hadn't happened before. It's an act of courage, huge act of courage. And then deep engagement um, with, you know, okay, so we're going to be artists and we're making um, um, art in an Indian context. What does it mean? You know, how do we understand abstraction? What is Indian abstraction? And I think that's what I see as the progressive element here is this sense of um, how do you take a great narrative tradition and condense it or push it such that it can have um, relevance without necessarily telling you a story. Well, uh, um... I'd, I'd really like to explore the notion of the act of courage that is involved in art making. Uh, Anish Kapoor speaking over there is channeling a, an, a, a statement attributed to Thayab Mehta, picking up a brush is an act of courage. Picking up a brush is an act of courage in this country. Um, the historical relevance of the progressive artist group aside, uh, I'm quite interested to hear you speak, Pushpa Bala, about these acts of courage that artists perform and about uh, the second issue, which is um, mobilizing narrative traditions from uh, the history of art in India into contemporary practice, uh, both of which I think are quite significant aspects of your own history and of your own work. I, I have another take from Anish Kapoor about the progressives, so I'd like to sort of start off with that. Uh, I mean, he talks, I think uh, the break happened at independence, because before independence, when we were a colony, in fact, uh, we're just working on a book on K. Venkatapa, who was part of the Bengal school. Uh, so I've been really thinking about this, and of course, the Bengal school, or uh, artists pre-independence were uh, interested in, uh, uh, you know, uh, protesting the colonial imperialism. Sorry, can't, can't you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I saw Chaitanya's expression and he sort of, yes, uh, wait, let me get my thread back. Yes, yeah, so, um, basically, uh, well, it's called revivalism and, uh, um, it was looking at a sort of golden past and uh, uh, basically uh, trying to, uh, you know, um, whatever, like attacking or protesting against a kind of a colonial hegemony and uh, cultural imperialism where uh, Indian culture was denigrated. But there was a sharp break at independence, I think, because the progressive artists came together in the late 40s, probably, when did it start? 47. So I think they were not interested in this whole idea of. Uh, the nation as such, you know, they, they wanted, they were looking at the international. And this actually, the name itself, Progressive, came from the other progressive uh, formations like the uh, progressive writers, the, the left cultural formations like uh, the progressive writers and the uh, progressive, and IPTA, you know. And uh, so, uh, I mean, the left itself, these left, the, the left philosophy itself is uh, international like the Communist International or Workers of the World Unite. So it, it was sort of naturally international. And in fact, uh, they, were, they, they thought India is a free nation now and it's equal to every other country in the world. So they did not have to, you know, look at the indigenous or look at, they wanted to be up to date with everything that was going on. And in fact, most of them went abroad, probably except Hussein. They lived for several years abroad. So, and this is very interesting talking about the film as well, because in the 50s and even some of the clips and the songs, a lot of the people from uh, the progressive writers and uh, IPTA joined films, Bombay films, Hindi films. So a lot of the films, the script writers, the directors, the lyricists were all from, uh, you know, uh, were all left. 
and uh, which is uh, I think and they were you know very fine sort of artists and creative people and uh, I think that is why those uh, works are so classic. So this was the milieu in which always everything was going on as well. Even though some of these things are not shown in the film and probably were not part of uh, the Gandhi's uh, lives. So uh, talking about, I mean, I think uh, maybe you mean censorship and I'd like to talk about that. I think uh, it was in the 50s that uh, I can't remember the date where uh, Akbar Padamsi was arrested for showing uh, obscene works, I mean, nude works in Jahangir Art Gallery. And I think that became a kind of a case. And then, um, but there it was, uh, I think, much simpler than it is today. Because later on, I think, uh, the, uh, you know, there were concerted attacks on Hussein uh, from the late 80s onwards, from the rise of uh, Hindutva, where he was consistently attacked and uh, physically attacked. His uh, uh, exhibitions were attacked, and not only Hussein, but also some other artists. In fact, I think at one point in the 90s, um, Boop and Kaka's uh, exhibition was also closed in NGMA. So that was another thing. And that's when I think uh, the mob started coming in. It was not the government. Like in, in Akbar's case, it was the police, the Bombay police who shut down the show or arrested him. But later on, it became sort of people like, you know, mobs. And I think now we have this threefold sort of attack on artists. You know, on the one hand, there is uh, the government. And uh, then on the other hand, uh, there's the social media. So incessant trolling, you know, and it's, uh, I mean, you know, accusations, I mean, like uh, threats of um, rape and murder and uh, torture and so on. In fact, I've been following the Sushant Singh uh, Rajput case very closely and, uh, you know, what's happening now. And it's frightening, you know, where, where in the different areas in which uh, it's uh, trolling is uh, hate mongering and trolling is going into. And the other thing is uh, the physical mobs, you know, the lynch mobs. So as a woman alone, you know, like a single woman and all, I'm, I'm scared. Even though I'm doing sort of critical work, I mean, I think we are self-censoring ourselves all the time. Not that, you know, uh, one expresses oneself very freely. I don't believe that. I think there is a certain amount of self sort of censorship that is going on because uh, uh, I think one wants to be careful in how one says because it, you don't want it to become uh, sensational either, you know. So it's a kind of, uh, so one has to find these kind of ways in which uh, uh, you can express what you want to say and uh, be a little, um, what can I say, not so obvious about it maybe. And uh, there are interesting examples because uh, there's, uh, I mean, I'm very interested in the nationalist movement and uh, at every point the British government was censoring the uh, uh, nationalist movement. So these, uh, you know, uh, messages were going around uh, many times, many times using the epics uh, or but it would keep changing as well or symbols and it would be in plays, it would be in novels, it would be in poems, it would be circulating as postcards for instance, it would be in films uh, but there would be sort of uh, symbolic sort of uh, uh, images being used like for example Draupadi Vastraharan was, was a kind of uh, metaphor for colonialism, rape was a, a metaphor for colonialism, for instance, and, and so on. So I think it's a scary situation. And um, I think we have to find, we have to find strategies, uh, in fact. Uh, and, you know, some years ago, we were having a call, some of us were having conversation and uh, we were talking about Bhupen. And uh, as a student, actually, when I was a student, Bhupen came out. So then, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've been to his place, but uh, he used to work in the living room. His studio was the living room. Now it was open house, so all kinds of people used to drop in. And uh, he was a chartered accountant till the end. So he had all these strange, good you, uh, like, you know, uh, conservative looking um, elderly men always there in his house. And he would be painting over there or his large uh, homosexual paintings would be uh, kept there, you know. But there was no problem. I remember even going in, even in his exhibitions, like in Kemal, for instance, all kinds of people would come there and there was no problem, uh, you know, because of the lack of uh, social media and because uh, basically maybe the art scene and many of these things were like um, sort of communities, you know. Uh, so they would be within the physical sort of uh, distance uh, of what was, um, uh, you know, wherever it was happening and it was not going in an uncontrolled way, you know, all over, you know, all over the world, maybe, you know, so uh, you, you were not sort of, uh, it, 
you know now what i'm scared is that uh, everybody has a mobile phone so if there is something happening uh, you can't control uh, people taking photographs so anybody could take photographs and in one second it's on facebook or on uh, whatsapp and it's uh, uh, traveling everywhere so if 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 i may i'd like to uh, segue into the next clip uh, because there are a couple of very important um, points from the film that we haven't yet got to so um, if if it's possible to bring up clip number 4 please in the early 1980s i started to make regular trips back the old bombay was disappearing making way for something more brash and commercial the great textile mills were closing but not without a fight from workers who went on strike Kaki Manzil was caught up in this change Once the house was a quiet seaside haven now it was being consumed by the expanding urban sprawl just uh via the lynch mob uh or in fact what happens to um people's right to live and to make a livelihood uh in in um, the most thriving metropolis in india um as as a as a as a student of the urban i'd really like to have anish's thoughts about um these questions of uh the production of marginality you know chatna thank you so much for the lovely question i think it gives one space to reflect a little upon the conditions that made kiki manzil the space of resistance that it does eventually become and a space of resistance that's cataloged by the film quite explicitly both during the emergency and then the riots i think very glad to be here of course with everyone here and i definitely do want to reflect a little upon what both shali and pushmala have said in their respective presentations i think i want to begin a little bit with context about why kiki manzil achieves and acquires the significance that it does it's because it is one of the few physical spaces that are available in a city that's shifting in a city that's changing in a city like bombay that's always been defined and dominated by space whether it's from reclamation or the sort of steady rise of urban sprawl i think kiki manzil finds itself in the most important yet difficult position slowly in the post independence era when you're seeing the death of the labor movement and the sort of forced crushing of the labor movement in bombay you're seeing the sort of steady disintegration of the central line as the backbone of the city and the backbone also of resistance social and political you're also seeing the expansion of the city into new avenues into spaces like bandra into spaces outside of the traditional island city and you're also seeing a ghettoization and a sort of division of the city into pockets that require some sort of space to reimagine what bombay lives for and what bombay stands for i think amidst all of this you see kiki manzil emerge as a space where people of different faiths people of different political ideologies can come together it becomes a hiding space for those who are threatened by the state it also becomes a space to think about the future of the city in many ways for instance with the peace committees after the riots for me i think exploring that role of kiki manzil is important alongside understanding the transformation of the city that has come about in recent years both in the sort of early parts that we see in the film and even later on which is uh, an intervention and a creation of marginalization as you said chatanya not just by real estate i would argue but very actively by the state as well you know sarovar zaidi writes a beautiful essay on jj flyover talking about the politics of surveillance and how the entire muslim community under that flyover is surveilled by this massive uh, structure that's embodiment of intra politics 
and about how, and then Nefertiti Tadiar more recently in her work on the Philippines showcases how flyovers and built infrastructure created by the state, in fact, creates urban archipelagos, which are sort of um, islands of class prosperity amidst sort of a sea of poverty and other forms of social degradation, which when you combine it in an Indian context is caste degradation and sort of presence of caste minorities and presence of religious minorities. So Keki Manzal becomes the space to challenge the, the, the archipelago, uh, archipelago that Bombay is becoming the sort of haven of only rich pockets surrounded by parts of the city that nobody wants to look at. And it becomes a space to question these narratives that are being undertaken at the same time. I think I want to push that narrative a little further because I think it's important to remember that it does embody a certain sort of Nehruvian politics. And with the sort of Bombay progressives and the idea of India that is being shared and espoused by the group of people who organize and assemble at Kiki Manzil, it is, uh, it is this sort of liberal vision for a country that seems to be slipping under their fingers, right? You see it with the Bombay riots, you see it with the demolition of the Babri Masjid, you see it in the frustration that's characterized in the latter half of the movie and the fight with Hussein, uh, a little earlier also the fight with Hussein with the emergency that really marks the sort of tension between what ideals one can stand for and what ideals will be productive in countering the wave of sort of authoritarianism, the rise of Hindutva and other forces that are in play. I think finally it comes in this, in this strange time when you're seeing art as a conscience keeper and you're seeing artists uh, take on this role as speaking truth to power, assembling and organizing and becoming sort of, and being, being the, the reasons, the clarion call for progress. And it becomes social and political progress, but those lines get fractured. Uh, of course, I think the, the, the simpler things to note are that Keki Manzil is a physical space. It becomes used as a site of protest. Uh, Rambas Bhatkal, a popular Prakashan, has mentioned earlier how he used to live in a fourth floor walk up in, uh, in Mahim, which was very useful during the emergency and even after because you could see the police climbing up. I'm sure Kiki Manzil also had that advantage because of a vantage point to see whether somebody is coming through. Would you please roll Akil's clip? The riots impacted everyone in the city. including its artists. There is um, so much conflict between the communities. There is violence. Then I thought Gandhi is everywhere on a rupee note. For every third road is called MG Road. But Gandhian philosophy of non-violence and love for fellow human beings is lacking. You know, it's a hypocrite society. And how to depict Gandhi was a problem because I was interested in, you know, Picasso, Matisse, you know, Tayab Mehta and Bhupen Khakhar and those things would come in my painting. But to go back to a great statesman, how to handle it? Exactly during that time, I came across a statement by Gandhi saying that I am not a seer, rishi or a philosopher of non-violence. I am an artist of non-violence. And I want to develop the art of non-violence in the realm of re uh, resistance. So I said, oh, if I see Gandhi as an artist, then I know what to do it. Thank you very much. Um, Akil, if I may um, ask you to um, Please share some ideas um, around the notion of this artist of nonviolence that Atul Dodia is um, paraphrasing the Mahatma over there. Um, and the notion of the artist of nonviolence uh, invoking modes of resistance and possibly modes of denial that are available to the atomized subject in speaking truth to power. Uh, it would be really wonderful to have your thoughts on this. Uh Thanks, Chavana. I also want to thank uh, Beros for this film. You know, I don't want 
an aspect of the film to get lost uh, because we are talking about these great issues, uh, public issues. Uh, the film has a lot of domestic charm. And, and I think we, we, uh, that's some part of it that I really uh, enjoyed uh, very much and brought back many memories of, of, of Bombay in my youth, um, which was spent uh, in Jahangir Art Gallery uh, at, at the cafe a lot. So I, I have uh, very good memories of uh, much of the art displayed uh, in, the, in the Gandhi galleries. Um, Chaitanya, your, your question, you, you began this uh, 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 discussion right at the outset by talking about nation building and modernism. And, you know, uh, Atul's point about uh, the centrality of Gandhi in this is that really there are two notions of nation building. Um, there's the European notion, which is very much present in the Hindu nationalism today. That is, in Europe, nations were built by a very specific method. Nations were built by finding an external enemy inside the territory of the nation and saying the nation is ours, not theirs. This happened with, with the Jews, the Protestants in Catholic countries, the Catholics in Protestant countries, the Irish, you know, everywhere. Nation building in Europe happened in just the way it's happening now, especially since the late 1980s in India. So India is really mimicking uh, Europe now. Uh, the idea of nation building that, that Gandhi was trying to present was exactly not the European idea of nation building. What Gandhi was trying to tap was a sort of unselfconscious pluralism in the history of India, in the history of the Indian people, and make nation building a matter of anti-imperialism by bringing in all of the pluralities into the national movement. That was Gandhi's idea of nation building, sort of really the opposite of what it was in Europe. And I think what Atul is saying, I mean, Atul talks about nonviolence and nonviolence was central to this, but the primary idea here was that resistance comes by including the entire plurality of the Indian people into the anti-imperial movement. That was how the Indian nation was built. And it wasn't built in the way it's being built now by finding an external enemy within and uh, subjugating it, saying the nation is ours, not theirs. So that's the real contribution, I think, of, of Gandhi to the subject of nation building. Uh, and a different modernity was, was sought by him. Now, I think that one of the interesting things about uh, art and literature and so on, and, and uh, resistance about which Atul talks and you ask, is that in a way, what we saw last winter in India uh, really went beyond Gandhi. And I think that's something really worth recording. You see, what happened in the streets and the maidans and the squares last winter, until, it, until the pandemic put an end to it, is, is the youth and women especially, who, who came together to do what politicians were just unable to do. And that is to invoke the abstractions of and codifications of the constitution with the art and literature of popular religion. You know, Sufi, Bhakti, all sorts of remarkable, you know, poster art, uh, 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 Kabir chants, uh, uh, Sufi slogans and so on were brought in into uh, the resistance. And all in the name of standing up for the constitution against the destruction of the constitution by the uh, uh, 
efforts of this government uh, uh, to destroy notions of citizenship, which were abstractly uh, configured in the constitution. So Gandhi was very much against the idea of making constitutional codification central to politics. His was the politics of movements. Right? And, and uh, he made a dichotomy. I mean, he, it's not as if he was against it, but he was relatively indifferent to things like uh, codes and constitutions and uh, abstract notions of just citizenship. He thought you, you can't make people better by transforming them into some uniform abstract idea of citizens. People are people, not citizens primarily. They are primarily human beings. So there's a sense in which what I admired very much about what was happening in the uh, squares and the medans uh, last winter was that it brought together abstract, propositional, constitutional uh, elements with the art and literature and slogans of popular religion. And that's a combination that nobody has succeeded in doing. Uh, in a way, Nehru was, was, saw the worth of both the constitution and of India's pluralistic popular uh, past. But for Nehru, these worked in two different registers. What, what was happening in the protests of, of the last winter was that they were integrated. And I think that's a very remarkable achievement and something which people who study art and who study resistance really ought to, to elaborate and, and study uh, much more. I want to just say one thing, excellent uh, point that Sugar made uh, when, when he was speaking initially. See, a, a lot of the cosmopolitanism of Bombay that, and of art that this film, uh, Berros's film uh, presents. See, a lot of the cosmopolitanism in, in a country like India uh, and also other countries all the way to Southeast Asia went through very different phrases. There was the phrase of maritime trade. That was one form of, of uh, cosmopolitanism and should have referred to how people came in, in uh, traders came, all sorts of people came, and Bombay was a sort of a hub for, for that for centuries. Then there was colonization, which brought a different element, a different factor in, into uh, cosmopolitanism. You, you know, uh, um, uh, colonization by, by brute force uh, introduces an element of cosmopolitanism. And now, since the 1980s, uh, or basically since 1990, there's a quite different form of cosmopolitanism that comes from the financialization uh, of capital and the globalization of finance. And that really happened with, with uh, Manmohan Singh's uh, reforms and so on after 1990. Now, what's very interesting is that this film actually is about art, which is in the period when none of these cosmopolitanisms had these large sources, maritime trade, colonialism, and financial globalization. It was in the period of immediately after independence when there was, none of these things were in play because globalization didn't really start till 1990 in India. So, so what was very important about something that, that Shuddha said uh, in, in his remarks, he used a phrase which I think is really very telling. And he said that what some of this art captures is that is what people do and can do that they don't have to do. And I think that's a very important thing to focus on because when you talk about these large determining forces, whether it's it's trade or it's, it's colonialism or uh, uh, globalization or even resistance to them, you aren't really capturing what comes through in the interstices. They, these large determining forces force people to do what they do. Right? But what, what Shudha said was a lot of this art captures what people don't have to do 
and yet they do. And I think that's a very important uh, element in the nature of art, that it captures the interstices that are between the determining forces which shape the events and, and, uh, and actions. And that's something really worth always emphasizing when one is talking about art. Um, and in a way, I want to end with a question to people uh, who are much closer to the art world than I am. It's a very interesting thing to me that cosmopolitanism in the art world began so much before cosmopolitanism in the literary world, the textual world. So when the first Biennale was in, in 1897, there was some idea that one was going to do this art for the world. But I don't think in literature it happened till basically the 1980s, when, when novelists like Salman Rushdie and Pamuk and all, they, they for the first time started to write for a completely global audience. Uh, I mean, Arkin Iran wrote for people who were, lived 200 miles around him at most. Uh, and most people wrote for people who were uh, 200 miles around them at most. And, and uh, the idea that there would be a biennale of this kind for the, for the textual world, of the literary world, was, was really not something that was envisioned by anyone. So what is it about art that cosmopolitanism started so much earlier in the art world? Is it because art doesn't need translation and it doesn't go through the the mediation on difficulties of translation and so on, the power of images is, is immediate. Uh, these are all questions that, that I think uh, puzzle me and I, I think you would know much more about it than I do, but I put it to you only as a question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akhil. Um, would, would, would you like to take that on uh, as a question, Shuddha, to um, uh, Malapon? Sure, thank you, and thank you for the question, Akil. Um, I have a slightly contrary view on this because I think that the commerce and transaction in images and ideas, um, from what I can make out uh, in this part of the world, has been a pretty um, widespread phenomenon. So if you look at, like, from the very early days of uh, Akbari painting, you're looking at workshops and ateliers that are quite cosmopolitan. Um, there are people traveling between Isfahan and Delhi and Agra, and they're also being seen in the Turkish and the Ottoman courts. There's very, very intense transaction of images between, um, between let's say, what's happening in Holland and what's happening in Delhi. So, you know, we know that Rembrandt is looking at Mughal miniatures and that the Mughals themselves are also looking at European painting. Um, this is an intense traffic. And I think that it's the other thing is that images and text are not belonging at that time, certainly to separate worlds. The world of the Mughal miniature is the world of books and folios and literary text. And again, in the Indo-Persianate world, and this is an area that I'm deeply interested in, there's a massive network of people actually exchanging literature, of writing for publics across thousands of miles, whether let's say between, um, between, uh, ha between Shiraz and the Deccan, uh, you know, I mean, there's a Republic of Persian letters that, that actually happens where poets are writing to each other in Iran and India. And that continues. I mean, I think that if you look at the beginnings of our modern literatures, I mean, my mother tongue's the first modern work is uh, by Michael Modushulon Dotto, who rewrites the Ramayan with the Meghnad Bodh Kabbu, and he's certainly reading his Milton, and he's, you know, he's he, he's reading Virgil, and he's he's producing a new literature in contact with the world. My, I'm persuaded to say that South Asia was in some ways more cosmopolitan than Europe at the time in the early modern period, that at least culturally in terms of literature and 
art, visual art, and architecture. It was much more an intersectional space than Europe could be. The Ottoman Empire certainly is, Iran is, India is, East Africa is. These are hubs of a new consciousness, and that's true in literature, it's true in art, it's true in philosophy, it's true in theology. Colonialism in some ways interrupts this process, and it produces a kind of one-way traffic between the Atlantic coast and South Asia, rupturing many other conversations that may have been happening at the time. The 19th and the 20th century are a partial recovery of this. So when I'm talking about a city like Bombay and its place in a, in a let, let's say, in a Persian-speaking sphere, in the 20th century, that's what I'm hinting at, that this is where Iranian literature is being produced, Iranian cinema, music, all of this is being journalism, has a relationship to Bombay. And this, for me, is, is quite a crucial thing, because, I mean, even if you look at the history of modern art, uh, I had a long conversation with Shirin and Behroz about something that's hinted at in the film, which is, I think, very fascinating, but sort of elided over, which is when does Indian art begin to have an international public? When does it actually get patronage? When is it being, when does it get bought internationally? And the Keiko and Behroz Gandhi play a very key mediating role in this transaction. I mean, I've read a lot of art historical research that seems to suggest that there's an auction with the Christie's in the 80s, um, you know, the globalization moment that you suggest. But my, what I'm interested in is that the first big money in Indian art, when artists like Hussein or, or Krishan Khanna go back with money in their pockets, is when the Empress of Iran, Shahbanu Faradiba, comes visiting in 1969, has a meeting with Behroz and Keku Gandhi, buys up an entire collection, which is still sitting in Tehran, right? And that's when, for the first time, you have a situation where modern Indian progressive artists say, okay, you know, I, we've got some money now. And that's a very fascinating thing. It's a very, very interesting moment where there's actually, and, and it's happening elsewhere as well. It's happening in the Persopolis festivals, it's happening in music, and this kind of new, kind of nuanced, different cosmopolitanism is perhaps something for us to recover. I mean, I'm very conscious of the fact that Bombay's trade union movement features this bizarre character called Murray Purdy, who's a South African Trotskyist, who is organizing dock workers for three decades in Bombay, and no one seems to know anything about him, right? goes back and forth between Durban and Bombay. These are really live connections. It's in cinema, it's in literature, it's in painting. And perhaps these people are witnesses, unconscious and conscious witnesses to this phenomenon. So art, yes, because it is unmoored from the task of producing national literatures, maybe a little freer. Cinema certainly is. I mean, that's why you, you see that the 1930s and 40s in Bombay cinema is actually a cosmopolitan working place. There are people from everywhere, in, as technicians, as actors, as directors. And these produce new effects of a new modes of being. So that when Sahir Lodhianvi's song, you know, um, Chino Arab Hamara, Rehene Ko Ghar Nahi Hai Sara Jahan Hamara, is sung in a Bombay street in a film, it seems flawlessly natural. You see, I'm, I certainly agree with you, and that was part of the point I was making, that, that a lot of this informal uh, cosmopolitan exchange took place during the maritime, I mean, partly because of trade. I mean, it wouldn't have happened because, without trade, whether it's over the roads or over the seas. Uh, but I was talking really more, much more not about this informal uh, kind of exchange, cosmopolitan exchange, but the institutionalization of it in the Biennale, yeah. which only gets to have literary yeah. films and so on much later. And it's, it's about the institutionalization of the cosmopolitan ideal yeah. that I'm seeing is, is differentially. Uh, and I'd be, I'm just a little puzzled because I don't think that's been diagnosed sufficiently. No, uh, no it hasn't. You're right. Um, 
you know, I don't think we gave uh, uh, Madhwani, uh, no, uh, didn't some, uh, Anish, you didn't get a chance to, to speak at all. No, he did. Yeah. Oh, he did, he did, he did. I did, I did, I, did. I just got cut off in the end. Yeah, we, we, we lost Anish's sound, and so I was going to come back to Anish as um, 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 the final speaker for the evening, because we are um, running out of time very, very fast. Um, and I would uh, like to invite Anish to uh, complete what he was saying uh, before the sound gave way at his end. So we were, we were talking about, um, Anish was talking about um, the production of mar marginalization or the construction of marginalization and uh, the, the implications for uh, the city of Bombay in spe specifically. Mm -hmm. the city of Thank Bombay. you so much, Adana. This internet gave way, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a short note that I would like to conclude with, which is that that creation of marginalities by the state has given way to the creation of more diffuse marginalities in the identity politics space that don't necessarily exist geographically. I think the queer movement, the differently able rights movement, other forms of marginalization are now finding new ways of articulation that don't have the same politics as the caste and religion space. I think it's also been an interesting way to examine, it, examine how the sort of forced ghettoization geographically and the spatial sort of dislocation has given way to the rise of subcultures and communities on the internet that are repurposing space, that are sort of fighting back against these structures of violence. I think we saw that as uh, Professor Bulgrami said uh, this past winter where thousands of young people like me were out on the streets and communicating digitally and the creation of art that was very interesting, right? The posters being the most sort of innovative forms of resistance that came up that combined a lot of the theoretical debates that were being had. I think finally, there's also today a, a repurposing and a, a reshaping of the structures of oppression that we're seeing a little bit in India today, in Bombay also specifically, which will, I think, magnify and amplify in the days to come. The flyovers that I spoke of, right, are, are going over communities in Lalbagh and sort of Mohammad Ali Road that are now using the space under those flyovers for innovative reasons, right? There's a beautiful film by uh, Avijit and Mukul, who I think I hear, uh, uh, Mukul and uh, Rohan, who are also on this webinar today, Avijit Mukul Kishore and Rohan Shiv Kumar, which showcases how they become a space for music and how during the Ganpati celebration, the procession takes place under the bridge, disrupting the sort of ability of the state to silence those who lie underneath. And there is a sort of visceral speaking out and fighting back against these marginalizations created, a sort of speaking up and shouting back that is going to get amplified with protests against the CA and RC, what we saw with the RA protests in Bombay, what we saw for movements around Kashmir. And I think it's a, it's a history of protest that has a lot to reflect upon, upon the history of Keki Manzil as a space for protest and how I think Kemold has also evolved with the times to create innovative forms of those spaces for other forms of protest, other forms of articulations of larger issues that the city faces that I think will be exciting to watch in the days to come. Thank you very much, Anish. Um, we are pretty much right on 7.30 uh, Indian Standard Time. And uh, I think it is time for us to draw the discussion to a close. Uh, I would once again like to thank uh, Behroz and Shireen and Gallery Kemol for uh, bringing this webinar together. Um, and to um, all of the panelists, uh, Shuddha, Shaleen, Pushpamala, Akhil and Anish for your tremendous generosity uh, in sharing your time and sharing your thoughts with us today. Um, please join me in virtually thanking all of my colleagues and uh, um, hope to see you soon. 
Be well, everyone. Good night.